Hi, welcome everybody. This is the uh, Political Theory Institute's final event of the school year. So stay tuned for announcements of summer events. We usually have some summer events, uh, one in the late summer. Uh, so stay tuned for that. I'm very pleased to welcome our guest this evening, uh, Dr. Shalini Satkunanandan, who will be speaking about a philosopher who seems to lurk behind every aspect and potential of modernity and post-modernity. That's Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, and his most enigmatic and puzzling work, Thus Spake Zarathustra. Shalini Sakunanandan is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of California, Davis. She's the author of Extraordinary Responsibility, Politics Beyond, <clears throat> excuse me, Politics Beyond the Moral Calculus, which won the first book award from the Foundations of Political Theory Group of the American Political Science Association. She has also published articles on authors as diverse as Plato and Weber in the American Political Science Review. Probably Plato and Weber, that might be further apart than Plato and Nietzsche, actually. Um, political Theory, Perspectives on Politics and the Journal of Law, Culture and the Humanities. Her current book project, Passing By, reads Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra as an account of how withdrawal from politics, especially avoidance of political dialogue, can be essential to any attempt to create change through the articulation and practice of new values. Her talk will draw on this manuscript. She earned her, I, I, this, this was so great, I have to say, this was such a good uh, chapter. I enjoyed both your, your, your first and your second chapter. So you're gonna see me shuffling between pieces of paper with a lot of notes. Um, uh, I have a lot of questions. Uh, uh, she earned her BA from the University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia, and her PhD from the Jurisprudence and social policy program, University of California at Berkeley. Welcome, it's, it's great to have you. Um, so in the chapter that you provided for the student discussion, you talk about the opening encounter of Zarathustra with a hermit, um, the first case of Zarathustra's passing by. So first give us a, a little praise of what you mean by passing by, and then, uh, Guide us through this this first encounter and this first example of that. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's a real honor to be here and to talk about this book project. Um, so passing by is a practice and it's a practice that occurs um, when you're in the midst of other people, um, you come close to them and then for some reason you pull back, you withdraw. And I describe it as a coming close and then a veering away. And um, what I'm trying to do in this book project is show the value of withdrawing from engagement with others and withdrawing from dialogue in particular, if you are engaged in the project uh, of creating um, genuine change through the creation of new values. So um, so in, in this book project, which is called Passing By, I read Nietzsche's Thus Spoke Zarathustra, and Zarathustra is a fictional prophet created by Nietzsche, and Zarathustra is engaged in a struggle to create genuine change, um, and Zarathustra is trying to do so by creating new values to replace uh, the values of Christian morality, and he thinks Christian morality um, <clears throat> no longer provides meaning for shared existence and leads humans to devalue their bodies, their instincts, their passions, and the temporal world. So Zarathustra is someone who wants to create new values. He is in a period of, he's in a period, at the end of a period of solitude when we first meet him, and he's coming down from the mountain. He wants to go and talk to the people about his desire to create new values and get them on board with his project. As he comes down from the mountain, he, he, he has an encounter with a hermit, a solitary man, sometimes described as a saint. And um, this man wants to know why Zarathustra is coming down um, from the mountain, what, why he's returning to human beings. The, the hermit says, you know, I, I, I left human beings, why are you coming back? And Zarathustra says, you know, I'm coming back because I love human beings. And 
in the course of this exchange, Zarathustra realizes that this hermit still believes in God, still believes in the Christian God. And part of Zarathustra's project is to, to teach people that Christian morality has weak, is, is no longer authoritative in terms of the way they live, live their lives. And in that sense, God is dead. Um, but he decides he's not going to try to convince the hermit that God is dead. He just withdraws. He's not interested in a dialogue to show, uh, with the aim of showing this old man in the woods that he's wrong, that he's somehow misguided. So this is the very first act of passing by in the book. And I think it's um, significant because uh, we see Zarathustra immediately making a choice that a certain, a certain dialogue is not worth it. Yeah. Yeah. So three things stand out to me. Uh, one, I guess my, my first question that I have about this, which was maybe my first question upon reading the book is why does Zarathustra love humanity? And that's a question that emerges. I mean, there, there are many answers to that. And that's something that emerges gradually over the course of your chapters. But I want, I want to return to that. I, the other thing that struck me with relation to passing by is it's a two-sided choice. It seems to have to do with leaving the hermit's beliefs intact. We want to ask about that. Why is that important? And also something about self-protection. And the self-protection side of passing by is really the theme uh, of, your, of your chapter. Um, uh, I, I guess to begin maybe with the, the briefer maybe with a briefer question is why does he leave the hermit's beliefs intact? I think there's uh, many ways of answering many, many possible answers. I think one of it, one of one answer is that Zarathustra, uh, I think is very conscious of the fact that um, if you're in a certain affective or passional state, just having your belief corrected is going to be insufficient for you to change your orientation to the world. And I think that he thinks the hermit is so still under the thrall of Christian morality and is inhabiting its passional configuration in, in, in such a way that it's not worth him um, engaging with the, the hermit. Um, through dialogue, it's it's not going to work. It's not going to be effective. Um, and also, I think, quite frankly, he thinks that if it's giving the hermit some meaning, um, he's not going to take it away unnecessarily when he hasn't even provided. He, you know, he's still engaged in this project of creating new values to replace Christian values. Yeah, this is a something I thought that you brought up really nicely. A belief isn't just a a, a doctrine that you hold or not hold it's it's symptomatic of the the organization of your drives and so it's it's not something that can simply be exchanged there's a whole process um but i, I guess getting turning to the other one uh to the to the other question of this in speaking the speaker is somehow vulnerable to those to whom he speaks and i'd like to uh ask you about that there's uh you have a very nice passage about how removing the body from proximity to those with whom you're engaging in dialogue is is necessary for self-protection so i guess just to begin what's what's corrosive about other people's or, or potentially corrosive about other people's proximity and company and, and in particular speech with them yeah so um that there's sort of many levels at which one can answer that question. So I think the, 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 the first level, the easiest level to get to is that Zarathustra thinks if you're really serious about creating new values, um, you have to avoid dialogue in the regular venues of politics because those conversations force you to articulate your um, orientations in terms of beliefs that can be slotted into an existing organization of beliefs. He says you're forced to put your chair between a pro and a 
contra. So in that way, you're sort of too immediately reactive to the positions that are. The second reason to avoid speaking to others in the regular venues of politics is that um, humans have a habit of mirroring or imitating those whom they engage with. And there's a real danger in particular, Zaratustra thinks, that you could imitate the passions of revenge and pity, which he thinks are two passions in particular that prevent us from creating new values. Um, he also thinks that um, when we in, um, and, and, and so, so part of what's happening there is that when you engage with other people and you, you maybe start reflecting their passion, such as their revenge and their pity, um, in a sense, you threaten your own inner passional configuration. And Zarathustra thinks that we create new values out of our inner passional configuration. We sort of have to reconnect to the chaos of passions within and by giving those passions a new rank, ordering or priority, we create new value. So you want to be really careful about whom you're interacting with and what they're doing to your inner passional configuration, because it can really affect you. And that's because for Nietzsche and Zarathustra, um, as you said, um, Borden, the, the passions are primary and our thoughts and our beliefs are sort of just pale reflections or shadows of our passions. So you've got to be really protective of the body as the site of passions. And Nietzsche's all and Zarathustra are both always trying to sort of get away from the mind body split that they see, for example, in Christianity. Um, they think that it's not the mind ruling and directing the body, but it rather the body is primary. And this also has a consequence that um, you have to protect the body and the and watch the space that it's in because um, because it, you know our our physical presence somewhere can have real consequences for the body for our passional makeup and so and and hence for our creative capacities our create our ability to create new values out of the passion so you really want to watch where the body is in space and what the environment is doing to the body this is a real rejection of the idea that you can retreat to an inner psychic space no matter where you are and protect yourself from your environment. Zarathustra gives that a resounding no, that is not possible. Um, yeah, he has this beautiful passage in Beyond Good and Evil, which I'm teaching right now about how uh, the conscious mind bears the same relation to a thought as the act of giving birth to the child that's produced that really the form giving that takes place is not in the conscious mind, it's much deeper. Uh, and he there he calls it the drives. Yeah. And so he has this account of, of the self as subjective multiplicity, which he means a, a rank ordering of the various drives, and that each of the drives is a version of the will to power. So the will to power is not one particular passion, it's all the different uh, constituents of of uh, what he calls the what, what he wants to call the soul are versions of of the will to power and this is all rooted in the body but one thing that's that's uh really puzzling is to what extent what does Nietzsche think about the body what does Nietzsche think about biology because it's not exactly I mean given his critique of you know science and and the scientific understanding of objectivity and the, the claim to you know give an account of something that's on the other side of experience that that causes experience since it rejects that it's it's unclear what he thinks the body is so like a, a common misunderstanding is to view him as a lamarckian but a lamarckian still presumes this biological framework so it, maybe if you could uh sketch a little bit this curious what does Nietzsche think of what's the what's the status of the body, the epistemic status of the body? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So when I say that um, Zarathustra and Nietzsche foreground the body, um, I don't mean to suggest that they're simply foregrounding the biological body. They have a very expansive understanding of the body. <laughs> the body includes, um, you know, sort of material, our materiality, our, our, our cultural selves, um, 
you know, it, it's not simply the biological body. So the, the body is expanded to encompass all the other kind of aspects that give shape to our lives. And, 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 and what he's really trying to, to Nietzsche and Zarathustra are both trying to do a dethrone reason, if you like, um, and, 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 and bring in all of these other forces and factors that, that basically um, lead us to do and see and be who, who we are. And, and, and they're sort of non-intentional, if you like. So his idea of the body is extremely expansive. And one way of thinking about it is um, through Nietzsche's idea of digestion. <laughs> so he often talks about um, this idea that you have to digest everything in your life very carefully. So um, your books, <laughs> um, the people, the conversations you have, your food, um, the music, everything has to be digested into this expansive concept of the body. And that's how you look after yourself by looking at digestion and, and nutrition in, in this very expansive way. Yeah, it talks about metabolism. The spiritual yeah. metabolism, the, the, the rate at which somebody can assimilate new ideas or challenges to their views, things like that. There are two nice lines that come up. I think it's uh, uh, in Bianca Evil where he says in the epigrams and interludes where he says that uh, the abdomen is why a human being cannot easily take itself for a god. Uh, and, then, and then he has another line. Um, uh, about uh, philosopher needs, this might be in genealogy, where philosopher needs um, uh, good bowels working in the background like windmills, silently but constantly. Um, um, yeah. So, uh, in the end, it all comes down to digestion, is another thing that, that Nietzsche says. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, after the, the, the encounter with the hermit, Sarah Fisher goes down and, and he has this, this encounter that you, you spoke to the, to the students earlier about where uh, he, he wants to teach the villagers the overman. And uh, there's this tightrope walker and he tries to use a metaphor uh, of the tightrope walker to, to make the overman uh, understandable to the people he's talking to. So already he's altering his understanding to suit a particular, not exactly a political context, but a communal context. He's, so he's changing at least in expression or he's fitting his understanding of the overman to the people he's talking to. And then this jester appears and jumps over the, the tightrope walker and causes him to fall. Um, uh, could you say a little bit about that and, and how it fits into the, the, the passing by? And also say a little bit about uh, what this is all about, right? The last man and what's, what's the danger of the last man? These are all easy topics, just a couple of seconds. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but Borden, you have to promise me that if my explanation is too long, you'll just cut me off because I could go on a bit here. This, this, this is the fundamental <laughs> Nietzschean critique okay. of our world. We, okay. this is, we got ours. We, okay. Don't. All right. So, um, so Zarathustra is trying to create new values to overcome Christian morality. And this means that Christian morality has in some way to be overcome. And the worry is that you know his the reason he wants to replace christian morality is that he thinks that no longer allows human beings to find meaning in their lives and um he's trying to create a new set of values that give meaning to this world to the temporal bodily passional world that we inhabit and not have meaning in a world beyond and zarathustra thinks the possibility he calls the possibility of overcoming christian morality the overman <laughs> um and it's easy to sort of think of the overman as a kind of superman figure 
you know, a figure who just rejects Christian morality and valorizes power. It's really not what, what it is. Um, and the overman, in a sense, just stands for the possibility of overcoming Christian morality. And I want to emphasize possibility there because Zarathustra thinks we're so far away from overcoming Christian morality, he can't even really articulate what that would look like yet. So the overman is just stands for that possibility in its bare form. And as I mentioned to the students earlier, the overman, we initially, when Zarathustra begins, it, the overman sounds like um, the alternative to Christian morality, like as, as in somebody who will instantiate the alternative to Christian morality. But as it progress, as the text progresses, we see that Zarathustra emphasizes this idea that any morality, even the morality that will replace Christian morality in the distant future, at some point will stop supporting a vibrant human existence and will need to be overcome. So the overman stands in a sense for the possibility of overcoming any morality that fails to support human flourishing and a meaningful existence. So, um, the hey, I'm, hang on. Yeah. let me just, so, uh, um, Gabe's reminding me of, of something that I should have done earlier. And I, I always forget. And that is please go to the Q and a to put your, your questions, uh, there, and we'll have a question time after that. But if you have questions, please go to the, 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 the Q and a to, to register them. Um, well, so actually let me interject a, a question. So what's Nietzsche's understanding of flourishing? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, so I think at, at a very, um, at, a, at a basic level, um, we flourish uh, <laughs> when we have values that um, reflect our condition. So our human condition, our temporality, our embodied selves. And when we have values that don't make us reject um, the constitutive features of our existence, um, that's a very formal way of 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 um, you know understanding flourishing. It's kind of like a negative way. But then Nietzsche also, in other works, and Zarathustra in this work too, talks about the will to power, which is the will to grow stronger and um, discharge strength. Um, and it's not just a struggle for bare power. The will to power for Zarathustra is also an interpretive act. It allows you to interpret the, the world in certain ways to give the world meaning. And in this way, the will to power is also what allows us to create new values to give meaning to existence. So flourishing for Nietzsche, I think, is also um, a condition in which we embrace the will to power, which is a constitutive feature of all being, <laughs> and don't try to deny it um, and don't try to repress it because he thinks that's extremely damaging. Yeah, so the values that he wants to create, I mean, there, there will be, he wants to create new tablets. He expects those new tablets to replace, to be replaced at some point by other new tablets. But the whole point of the overcoming is to be in the service of a kind of embrace of the will to power, a, a kind of a affirmation of that as the, the fundamental character of, of all being and of human flourishing, right? So there, there's, there's a, a, a prospect of future revolution and nevertheless a, 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 a claims making by Nietzsche and by Zarathustra about what the framework of those revolutions should be. Is that right? Yeah. So I guess may I think I think if I think I I, I think I understand what you're you're saying there, Gordon. It's like um, on the one hand, Zarathustra seems to leave open what the values that are to replace Christian morality are gonna are going to be. Like he doesn't really give us their substance. That is something <laughs> that is you know will eventually happen, hopefully. But we've got to just overcome the sway of Christianity in the meantime. But he gives us a lot of clues about what those values would look like, 
right? Sort of their formal qualities. They will respect and acknowledge the will to power. They will accept that we're temporal beings and not valorize a kingdom of heaven that's in some way outside time. Um, they'll accept the passions um, and, and the embodiment of human beings and not think that value lies in a disembodied state beyond this world, right? Yeah, so he gives us some clues as to what their substance might be, but that's a task that is, is, is sort of deferred to the future. And I think that's actually why this text is really helpful because in a way it allows us to um, investigate what, um, what it is or how it could be even possible to create any new values, <laughs> not just the ones Nietzsche prefers. It's almost like a formal investigation, if you like, of what it is to create new values and the preconditions for the creation of new values. So the, with the last man, I mean, there's this interesting thing about, about the dialectic, right? Because the, the, the problem with Christianity, at least as he articulates it um, in um, tarantulas and in genealogy and in, um, you know, chapter five of Bianco Nebel, is that it involves an inversion of will to power that in, in which the will condemns itself. And so the will, you end up with a kind of bottle up self-hatred but that's not the last man the last man is the end product of that in which the the passions have so depleted themselves in this war upon the self that you get somebody who i mean it's peculiar because he he treats the last man as not even up to the good old self-hatred anymore he's somebody who's sort of so tepid that all the last man wants is comfort uh, uh, tranquility, a, a kind of retreat from all conflict or all assertion, um, uh, a retreat from any kind of question of meaning. So there's a way in which the, the last man is, is uh, a degradation of even the self-hating Christian because he's no longer capable even of imposing uh, that kind of meaning on his, on his own suffering. Is, is, uh, is that right? Yeah, I, I mean, I think so. I think it's, um, you know, this idea that, you know, Christianity has made us feel guilty in a sense about the will to power, right? And it turned the will to power in a sense inwards. We started fighting and trying to overpower our instincts and drives, which previously we'd had externally manifested in the will to power. And just that struggle against our instincts and drives has so depleted us and made us so exhausted that in a sense, we've given up the desire to will in a full, in, in, in a robust sense at all. Um, and so to the extent that we, 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 we don't even seek to create new meaning anymore. We're not worried about giving meaning to our suffering. We just want the suffering to end. And that's, kind of the last man, the, we're last human beings when we get to the point where we just want to end suffering, eradicate it, and we don't, we lose all aspiration to give meaning to our suffering existence. And this is a real problem for, for Nietzsche because um, he thinks suffering belongs to human existence. It's never going to disappear. And that the real challenge is to make sure we have kind of values that can give meaning to our suffering. That's what allows us to embrace our lives and this world. But if we become last human beings, just focus on eradicating suffering, give up on any aspiration to meaning, he feels there's kind of no way out. Like at one point, at some point we'll entirely lose the will to create new values altogether. And we'll just be stuck at that point of being last humans. There's no turning back. We will sort of give up the possibility of seeking meaning altogether. So he wants to avert that kind of, you know, catastrophe. Yeah, there's there's a dual inheritance from Christianity because on the one hand nihilism seems to come out of Christian self hatred. On the other hand, he really values the ascetic will. I mean, everything interesting and great about a human being comes from a kind of internalization of will where you impose demands on yourself, and this can be something that's that's great. And and this is his account of of philosophy. And so he's he makes a big point. For example, in, in Beyond Good and Evil, of 
talking about the conscience of method, right? Philosophic rigor comes from the conscience of method. All high cultures come from an internalization of cruelty. There's, I mean, he uses very harsh language to indicate, uh, uh, you know, he wants to take away the sugar coating from his account of, of um, the, the passionate resources that, that produce uh, you know, what we are and what we can be. But he's very appreciative of, of this one side of, of the internalized will. Um, and it seems to me that that's what he wants, uh, that's what he wants to, to preserve. So you've got this great, um, uh, let's see, I'm not gonna be able to find the, the page number, but um, you have this great account of kind of the different ways that speaking to others involves in a way a kind of betrayal of ourself to the common. And, and part of it has to do with the way in which uh, speech is, is such a small constituent, reason really, reason is such a small constituent of, of you know, what Nietzsche calls the soul, the subjective multiplicity that is the soul. Um, and so speech is always reductive because reason is always reductive, but then it's also that speech, uh, reduces things to, uh, reduces experiences to what can be shared. So you're kind of sticking everything into a, a you know, a square peg, uh, in that respect. Um, uh, and this is especially true for the rare, the people whose inner experiences are, are in a way most distant from what other people experience. But then there's also um, the problem that even if you were sufficiently poetic and capable of eluding the snares of language, uh, and clearly there's a lot in Nietzsche's texts that's about that, that pushes the boundaries of language because he's trying to evade the, the snares. Uh, but even if you were sufficiently gifted in that, there's the, there's the danger of premature articulation. And that's what causes... So I, I talk about this and about, you have this really nice passage about uh, the stillest hour yeah. and uh, uh, that, that scene. So please talk about that. Yeah, so um, I guess... One of, yeah, so to talk about the way that communicating reduces things to what is capable of being communicated, uh, namely communication reduces things to what is common, to what is already shared. So one of the things Zarathustra teaches, and he, you know, he eventually he gives up on speaking to the people in the marketplace, and he tries to cultivate a select group of followers who could help him maybe bring in these new values which he thinks is a long-term generational a project of many generations but one of the things he tells them is um you know go into your solitude and you know connect to your inner passional chaos because the passions are the raw materials of new values but he also says you know as as you're reconnecting to your passions as, and as maybe new values are emerging within you, be very careful, like don't run out and speak to other people about them prematurely because you'll immediately reduce these values, these virtues that are new and still developing inside you to what is already shared. And so you'll ultimately just reformulate existing values instead of uh, creating new ones so like really hold off on the speech as long as possible and I think the other piece of that is that it's not it you know obviously anytime you speak your new values you're in danger of reducing them to the values that already are and I think that's also why it's really important for Zarathustra to engage in repeated practices of passing by because uh, constantly living outside of the regular institutions of politics and the regular institutions of shared life will give you more of a chance to fully embody these incipient values that are sort of 
you know, being you're cultivating within you. And so by embodying them, <laughs> I think the idea is you can share those values with other people through your embodiment of them without simply just articulating them in this common language that might reduce them. D does that make sense? So passing by gives you a chance to develop new language, but it also for, 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 for describing the world anew and creating new values, but it also gives you these spaces of solitude and distance from mainstream politics and shared life um, that allow you to come to embody those new values. And, 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 and through exemplifying them, that's also how you share them, right? Without reducing them. <laughs> Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, I think it's Yeah, it seems like there, there are two parts to that. And I really like the way you lay this out. There's there's the embodiment of it. Uh, there's also an it but in that there's giving yourself space to you know let let what's inside you kind of percolate up. But there's also an attendance to the percolation, by which I mean to say, <laughs> I'm just realizing what a ridiculous formulation that is. Attend to the percolate, the percolation. Don't use French press or yeah. drip. It's the percolating. Uh, uh, but you have this really nice passage that I'm going to read. Uh, <laughs> uh, see, it's the Starbucks. I've, I've you know. Yeah. My mind's been uh, slotted into the pre-existing ideas of, uh, um, you know, venti cappuccino. So um, you have this. So what I mean is that there's something essential to speak somewhat paradoxically about flux and and you know the, um, being as becoming. That is to say, everything is change. That's true of uh, your internal states. Uh, people have a certain fate within them, but that fate is includes a fate of change, of a, a fate of internal self overcoming. And so, by giving yourself space, you can uh, attend to the changes within yourself and within the sort of the, the field of experience that is, that is being. So here's the, here's, here's, here's you, you say this, <laughs> I, I swear you say this um, in solitude. It is possible to coast being not as static things in themselves, but as becoming to language here, all of beings, words and word shrines burst open for me. This is Zarathustra speaking. Here all being wants to become word. Here all becoming wants to learn from me. Here how to talk. Becoming is closer to words in solitude, though there is no possibility of ever getting behind words. And by the way, because there's no getting behind experience. I think that's, that's uh, um, in solitude away from received ways of experience. Uh, sorry, in solitude away from received ways of speaking the formation of words into beliefs and the channels of dialogue. Becoming seeks new words for its aliveness. Becoming wants to impress itself upon language and language becomes sensitive to becoming. Zarathustra experiences what is not yet common and nudges it to language. Here is a font of newness. That's really nice. So uh, um, there's, uh, uh, there's the matter of attending to what can be expressed and what can't be expressed, but there's, there's also the matter of attending to the, um, the, the flux within you. That's, um, uh, that can be captured, but only in this sort of provisional way. Um, and both of those require solitude. Yeah. I think the idea is that, you know, we have this passional chaos within, which is, a part of the communal passional reservoir <laughs> and also part of the world of becoming right our passions are sort of they're multiple they're in flux um, and we need to in some way get closer to that 
passional chaos and the world of becoming and in a way I guess just allow it to speak to us and present itself in language and um, we're closer to becoming closer to the chaos within when we're by ourselves in part because we don't have you know the the standard ways of speaking to other people sort of you know taking up our attention um, we can attend to becoming and um, I think that's really why solitude is so so important to Zarathustra because it allows that chaos and becoming to um, come to language in new ways you you're letting it do that you're not just imposing words upon becoming you're allowing those words to come to language almost on their own he describes it almost as as a revelation it's, it's super strained actually um but i think it's really the flip the, the other side of this is that he's really the, the, the emphasis on, is on how stale our language becomes our public language is and you know what are we going to do to make it speak anew which is what is really necessary if we're going to create radical change through the creation of new values um, yeah and i that's fine <laughs> well so it you know i think especially in zarathustra you really see the way in which nietzsche borrows from biblical imagery um, there's a way in which uh, uh, I, mean, I think Beyond Good and Evil is more about the Greeks and, and Zarathustra is more about uh, the Old and New Testament and especially the Old Testament. But I think about, you know, like the burning bush scene and, and the burning bush says, uh, you know, Moses says, who, who should I say, you know, who I say you are? And the burning bush says, I will be what I will be. Uh, and it, Nietzsche wants to uh, uh, shift that to the internal human experience. He sort of brings it down. He, he, he brings God down into the, the, the self as, as will to power. And solitude and, uh, allows for that embodiment um, for him. Um, I think you capture that really nicely. And in relation to this, this I, I want to get back to uh, this point um, that you make about how um, uh, the last for the last man, there's a way in which the death of God, the, the um, sort of the internal degradation of, of Christianity and its eventual uh, uh, you know irrelevance just opens us up to kind of superficially filling our lives with avowals. Uh, so we'll just say things. We'll, we'll uh, um, you know, as he puts it, we'll, we'll go to history as a kind of costume shop of, of beliefs. And uh, your account of this, uh, um, they have this great account of, of you know, Zarathustra and, and um, his critique of the state. Uh, and, and especially the critique of the, the marketplace. And the marketplace just made me think of Twitter, where it's hot takes. Uh, his account of the marketplace isn't really commerce, it's uh, public opinionating. And so we'll, we'll uh, uh, because of our, either our lack of internal resources, the passions have died out, or our distance from our own internal resources, um, we'll go to this costume shop and we'll, we'll apply beliefs to ourselves um, out of a kind of, you know, weariness. Um, that, I think, it helps to, to clarify why his project um, is so long-term and also why, I mean, one peculiar feature is the way in which his project, at least in Beyond Good and Evil, and I'm sorry to keep pulling it over to this other book, but uh, uh, I mean, he advocates for you know the creation of new religions, but it's not because he's a believer. It's because he wants, he thinks religions are are soul craft. They're they're how you shape people's internal drives, and in a way, you shape the body. And 
that's the more fundamental project of reform. It's, it's not that you give people a thing to believe in, this, in, the, in the form of an opinion or a doctrine. It's a kind of shaping of, of the embodied will, will, I guess. Yeah, so I, I, I think in a lot of ways, um, what one of the, the, the thing the most important things I think I've taken from Zarathustra in terms of my own learning is this um, the problem with a focus on belief. <laughs> so changing other people's belief as the path to change. And and you know, there are plenty of empirical studies in political science that show that this direct conversation about beliefs has no effect on Right. on people's beliefs if anything it makes them dig in but you know even putting that aside Zarathustra's point is um you know we tend to focus on beliefs uh, you know propositions that we hold to be true as the most important thing that we need uh that that, that we should you know work on in order to create change and, and you know he wants to shift focus to sort of practices and the passions and communal ways of living as 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 as, as really important to, to to shaping the self and to the creating change and i think you know in contemporary theory you know the last 30 years uh there's been a lot of work um criticizing this view of religion as a set of beliefs this sort of belief centric view of religion and and some theorists say it's sort of it's in part of it partly that comes out of um Prote um the protestant religion and and its focus on faith and belief right um and holding certain propositions to be true and that in some way when zarathustra starts to want to talk about passions and practices He's in a way also rejecting this Protestant focus on belief as so central to who we are and our, you know, flourishing, right? He's trying to decenter belief. And I think it's um, really important. I mean, stepping away some, you know, my project really focus on value creation, but if we step away from that issue for a second, like I think right now, even in just contemporary politics, we tend to focus on people as walking beliefs, right? That's how we encounter them um it's how we interact with them and i think it's super misguided and i think it's also what draws us into unnecessary dialogue um you know a lot of the times what i think we should be focusing on what people are doing on the consequences of what they do rather than what they avow right um and th that that's one of the things that zarathustra is it sort of emphasizes over and over again that this focus on belief is misguided yeah, it's always struck me that the the, the, the Rorty intake on uh, in in response to the Nietzschean challenge is that we hold beliefs ironically, and this is a common way of reading Nietzsche. And I confess, it's always struck me as superficial. Uh, I, I, if if beliefs are symptomatic of something deeper, then you can pretend that you hold something and you can pretend that you hold something ironically, but that doesn't really describe either the experience or the, the psychology. Um, so I think that's, that's missing something that Nietzsche supplies. Yeah. Nietzsche is very clear that um, often people think it's a sign of, you know, intellectual sophistication, not to have any beliefs, right. And to be free of belief. Um, but Nietzsche says over and over again in different works that you need to re retain the capacity to believe, right? Especially if we're going to create new values, <laughs> right? We may yeah. want to get rid of certain beliefs, but you need to retain the capacity to believe because if you lose the capacity to believe, then you're never going to be able to find any meaning in any value, <laughs> right? And and so for Nietzsche, it's, yeah, you have to be able to be bound by a fiction, but you still have to be bound. And he thinks that a lot of people who are atheists, you know, pride themselves on unbelief, but he says they just don't believe because they can't believe because they don't, they haven't connected to their passional selves in a robust way such that they can really even sustain beliefs right their, their beliefs 
are never really grounded in their passion. So they don't, they, they don't really have the capacity to believe. And he's always saying, that's not what my point is. I'm not trying to throw out the capacity for belief. I just want to get rid of problematic beliefs that lead us to devalue this world and prevent us from finding meaning in our embodied existence. Yeah, I mean, I've never actually met uh, um, a human being who's truly ironic. Uh, I mean, 80% of all freshmen who enter my classes believe both that there's no such thing as the truth and that it's true that all human beings are created equal and endowed with certain inalienable rights, et cetera, et cetera. And even the, the shallow unbelievers, I mean, he just says that the shallow unbelievers, they don't, they don't, they're not religious believers, but they do believe in things. They believe that it's, it's good to have a good living. It's good to, to have a nice reputation. Uh, it's it, their, you know, their, their focus is on uh, certain base goods that don't really amount to a particularly meaningful life. There's sort of a, a, a student of mine who's in the discussion uh, said they're, they're, they're sort of worker bees, uh, careerists. And so he makes fun of, you know, yeah, they're too his lazy. Fellow... Yeah, they're too lazy to have beliefs. He says <laughs> they just sort of go along with the flow. Yeah, I think he's, you know, he's not your people just associating with a kind of atheism, but his, his position on atheism is very complicated. Um, and he describes yeah. most atheists <laughs> in his, yeah, in his milieu. So, yeah, yeah um, uh, presumptuous dwarf and rabble man is is his phrase in in Beyond Good and Evil. Sorry for the dings. Um, so I'm getting. Uh, we should turn to questions. Um, lots of questions here. Okay. Great. Okay. All kinds of really interesting questions. All right. Um, so, uh, well, are you ready for questions? Anything more you want to say? No. Okay. 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 Uh, what would you say? This comes from uh, Mary Ruana, R-U-A-N-A, Ruana. What would you say is the most important differentiation between Nietzsche and Zarathustra? How does Nietzsche use Zarathustra's words and actions as a character to show this? It's a great question. That is a great question. Um, so, I, I mean, there are a lot of differences. I think, um, you know, in, especially in his later works, Nietzsche reveres Zarathustra. He just thinks that Zarathustra is so gracious and gentle. And even in his notebooks, he says, Zarathustra passed me by. Like in some way, Zarathustra surpassed me. He's better than me. I think he thinks Zarathustra is um, more able to pass by, to be honest, like mm. less um, able to be sucked into vengeful interaction, <laughs> right? And um, more full of a kind of love for humanity, um, more world affirming than Nietzsche in some way felt that he ever um, achieved. And so, he thinks Zarathustra is just almost like his better self. Um, I think there is a really big difference between Zarathustra and some of the, the writings that come later in that I think in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Zarathustra really rejects everything to do with the state and politics and public discourse in such a dramatic way. And I think Nietzsche was much more, in his later work, much more drawn to you know politics in a way more closely connected to what what we regularly understand of politics i think zarathustra really well, genealogy of moral is a polemic so i yeah. mean you can't be explicit <laughs> than that well the thing is that zarathustra is very clear it's okay to engage in polemics with worthy enemies but as that thus spoke zarathustra and you know zarathustra progresses it sort of becomes evident that he almost thinks there are no worthy enemies left anymore. So engagement is worthless. You know, in, you know, you should have enemies that push you to new heights of excellence, but he doesn't really see them anywhere. So um, <laughs> it's that he doesn't, he, he, he thinks that most of our enemies aren't worth fighting. Um, and I, 
in in that sense yeah he he's not against polemic per se but he doesn't think any polemics are worthwhile in his particular moment in time yeah yeah uh i'll I, i'll make this one comment and i'll shut up about beyond good and evil but one thing that he does a lot in, in beyond good and evil is that he'll make this somewhat polemic statement and then he'll retreat there's a lot of kind of ironic stepping back where uh he even puts uh his own opinions in the mouth of a moralistic pedant and trifler uh as my uh, moralistic pedant and trifler would say, and then he gives his account, and then he he steps back. So he seems aware of oh, that's of this. Good point, yeah. Um, so let's see. Usually, so this comes from Lawrence Lycan, Lycan or Lakin. Usually, Nietzsche connects Christian morality with Christian slave morality, transva transvaluation of values. Uh, what other Christian values does Nietzsche want to overcome? Um, I mean, I think what Nietzsche really wants to overcome Christendom as a whole, like he thinks that it's um, really caused us to devalue the very conditions of being human, um, our existence in time, <laughs> our instincts and drives and passions. And I think he thinks that it's all interconnected. So you can't even just maybe um, pick and choose which aspects of Christianity you want to get rid of. So, for example, um, he even says the will to truth in Christianity, the valorization of truth in Christianity is something we have to give up. This valorization of a, you know, a, a universal truth that's timeless and binds everyone, we have to give it up. And that if we don't give it up, we are still, in a sense, um, focused on valuing something other than what we have in the temporal world. And so he says that, you know, a lot of people think that science is the way to overcome Christianity. But he says science is almost like the pure form of Christianity's will to truth. Um, and we need to give it up if we're really going to embrace passional existence. You know, science equates truth with it putting aside of the passions right um, and Nietzsche wants us to see that we only ever come to truth through the lenses of our passions and objective truth is not to be without passions but rather um, the closest we'll ever get to any kind of objectivity is to see the world through the lens of as many kinds of passions as possible so I would say that he's really he wants all those all aspects of the Christian value system out because he thinks they're deeply interconnected. Well, I, hope that, I hope that answers your question, Lawrence. I, I hope I understood it correctly. This next one comes from Lulwa al Kaifa. How do we go about conversing about or projecting these human values with people who are quick to dismiss these thoughts as blasphemy? Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that sort of uh, relates to. Uh, the question of the hermit. Uh, I mean, he, Zarathustra just disengages entirely. Um, and I think part of what this passing by um, this practice does is that it suggests that, you know, sometimes the best way to counter a hegemonic value system is to create spaces in which you live your life in a different way and you try to live your life outside of those sort of hegemonic institutions and values in a way to perform how life might look without them that's part of what's going on in passing by so um sort of exemplifying a kind of life without certain values is the best way to um show the possibility of living without those values so um and 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 and, in, and it's kind of like a an embodied way of answering the one who would say that living without those values is some kind of blasphemy or un, un, untenable yeah yeah, yeah you, could, you can't really do it to show people because then you might alter your your behavior exactly you, you, know, <laughs> you just have to you know yes keep your eye on the ball so to speak and, and... That, that's exactly right yeah you can't 
you don't pass by in order to prove something to other people because if you're doing that, you know, I'm going to prove to you that you can live without this value by showing you how I'm living without it and how I'm living outside the regular institutions of politics because that's still too reactive. You're still defining your goal against what you're trying to overcome. The whole point of passing by is that you get out of that, that direct opposition that in a weird way leads you to end up maintaining what you're opposing because you've always got one eye to what you're opposing. You're always trying to refute it. Thank you, Borden. It was an important qualification. <laughs> well, yeah, sure. Um, uh, I think of, you know, he says, don't, uh, when philosophers fall in love with their own favorite doctrines, they, they, um, uh, they, they turn into a, a platform baller, just like somebody who stands on a soapbox, you know, in um, whatever that square is in London and, and proclaims. Um, so this comes from Jansen Washington. Uh, who's a student in the discussion. Yes, I, uh, I met him earlier today. Yeah. yeah. A main aspect of your work is the concept of passing by while not completely retreating. I wonder how you would draw the line between retreating fully while also protecting your own passions and beliefs. Yeah, no, that that's, goes to the heart of the matter. Um, I think that the idea with you can't um, if you're trying to create new values, you cannot uh, completely withdraw from shared life. Um, in part because it's through engagement that you get more insight about the realities of the current situation and what is to be overcome. Um, and you see through engagement, all of the detailed ways in which a certain, that the, the hegemonic values infiltrate all aspects of life. And so if you withdraw, in a sense, you're denying yourself an important, if you withdraw entirely, you're denying yourself an important part of the uh, learning and knowledge uh, accumulation that's really essential um, for the creation of new values. So the trick for Zarathustra <laughs> is to be engaged, but not be so damaged by that engagement. So intermittently engaging such that you get the benefits of engagement with and, and minimize the damage that comes from engagement, such as the fact that we end up defining ourselves against those we oppose, or we end up disconnecting from our passional and chaos and so on. Does, I hope that helps, Jansen. Great. So let's see, uh, I, have, I have a whole lot of questions. <laughs> I, uh, Okay, this is, this is the remaining question from students, the rest are from um, uh, faculty members. So here's the last student question I have. It's about, it's from a student in my Beyond Good and Evil class. It's about Beyond Good and Evil. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> I yeah. hope it's I can It's a very good it. question. It's a very good question. Um, in your description uh, of Zarathustra's return to humanity from the mountains, I couldn't help but think of Aphorism 29 and Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil. Why, yes. I the, the labyrinth and Ariadne's ball of thread that brings man back to humanity from the depths of the labyrinth. Is there a relation between the two? Does Zarathustra need to overcome the Minotaur of conscience in order to descend from the mountains? And this gets back to my opening question. Why does he love humanity? What, what draws him, him back? So that's from Preta Gobble. Okay. Um, wow. Okay. So... <laughs> I don't have Beyond Good and Evil with me, and but Ariadne is actually present in Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, um, <laughs> the god Dionysus sort of stands for the passional chaos. And in, in certain versions of the myth, Ariadne is ends up 
marrying Dionysus after the hero Theseus leaves her. And in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, the hero Theseus sort of stands for the heroic will that's going to go out there and like impose itself on the world and um, is going to know the world and have it be transparent to him. And um, Zarathustra sort of, part of what Zarathustra is getting at is that you sort of have to give up that heroic will to know and let yourself go under to your passional chaos. You kind of have to be like Ariadne and have Theseus leave the heroic will to know in order to let yourself just let go and experience the passional chaos that Dionysus stands for. Um, and so it, it is very, this, this image of Dionysus and Ariadne and Theseus is very important to thus spoke Zarathustra. Um, and if I had the passage of Beyond Good and Evil with me, I would be able to tie it more directly to, to Beyond Good and Evil. I, I can get it. Yeah, I, I could get it too, but I have to walk away. <laughs> well, um, yeah, it seems to me that there's, that there's a connection between that and his, his treatment of, of male and female, right? Because there's a way in which, um, I mean, you know, he says all these horrible things in, about women in Beyond Good and Evil, and, but there's something uh, fundamental about the feminine understood as a version of the will to power that draws people deeper than uh, the, the, the kind of the rationalistic pose. And, and um, there's something more, you know, to use his language, more fertile there. Yeah, and um, that's why D Dionysus is, is a god who, you know, has a lot of feminine characteristics. And um, that's Dionysus is Nietzsche's preferred divinity, right? And that there has to be some return to the Dionysian chaos within in order for us to be generative of new values. Yeah, a student told me that that in representations of of uh, Dionysus that that he's um, he's a very feminine male. Is that the? Yeah, some yeah, definitely. <laughs> the, okay. And he, you know, and he has his female worshippers. It's yeah. Okay, um, so this comes from uh, Jeremy Fortier. Oh, hello! I know Jeremy. <laughs> Early on, it was suggested that Zarathustra doesn't engage certain people because correcting their beliefs won't change their orientation towards the world. But how much can that sort of change be intentional or planned for Zarathustra or Nietzsche? Is it mainly a matter of solitary attending, that is to say, uh, receptivity, as the most recent part of the discussion has suggested? Differently stated, when does attending to the world stop and actively changing the world start? Good question. Yeah. So I think that, I mean, it's a great question. I, I think that um, I think the lesson in a way of Thus Spoke Zarathustra is that in order to create genuine change, you actually have to begin with receptivity instead of <laughs> sort of imposing the will directly. That it's the recept receptivity that should be primary and should be the main concern because that's actually what's going to allow you to connect with the raw materials, the passions of, the, of possible new values. And that, that moving straight away to a kind of willful creation is precisely what's going to stop you from being receptive to the world of becoming, to the flux, to the chaos. And you have to somehow suspend the will in order to be creative. And it's not that you're giving up on the will altogether. Nietzsche would never want that, but you have to figure out a will that is in some way receptive. Well, but uh, you're are you you're speaking of receptivity to the self and to to what's inside you, or are you speaking of receptivity to those you're you're seeking to affect? 
I guess I don't see that it as a may I guess I don't see it as either or because part of what you're attending to is becoming itself the flux of the world and and the other thing you're you're being receptive to the passional chaos within but that's part of the communal passional reservoir um you know that, that we 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 share a we share passions right um in all of us the configuration is a little bit different but we share from this communal passional reservoir that has come down to us you know through history uh, for want of a better way of putting it and so you're trying to a, a, attend to that communal passional reservoir in order to see what new values you could create that we can all find meaning in D does that make sense Gordon? So it's, i don't feel like it's you are attending to yourself yes but i think that the self it, it, the, the, the the passional self is in, in a sense quite expansive Yeah, um, but I, I mean, but part of the argument uh, that you've made presumes a decision about when someone is a worthy interlocutor and, and when they're and when they're not. Yeah. So it, uh, my understanding is that the question is, um, uh, to what extent are you, in a way, inevitably drawn into? Uh, interaction with uh, uh, um, inadequate inter interlocutors in in your project, um, uh, and so how do you navigate the 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 encounter with um, inadequate inadequate interlocutors? You probably share something with them, but as as Nietzsche says repeatedly they're they're not um they lack the depth that that you have and so there's this question of what what can you what can you even do for them so what so in that regard to what extent is is uh is it receptivity to 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 those that's um uh um an important part of the project here uh, no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think so. Yeah, I think it's re receptivity to um, um, I think it's receptivity to the passions and affects and drives that are overlooked by the hegemonic morality. And let me put it this way. It's um, when you're receptive to the passions and drives and affects that that are kind of, in, in a sense, effaced by the hegemonic m m value system, because the hegemonic value system prioritizes certain drives and affects and passions over others. Um, that's what a morality is. It's a prioritization of drives. Um, when you are receptive to the multiplicity of passions within you, that receptivity is part of what allows you to let go of that hegemonic morality because you're seeing that it's not actually all there is and that there's, there's something else going on. That's really important to Zarathustra because that's what is key to overcoming the hegemonic re re uh, morality. You, you have to, have to connect to what it doesn't exhaust and then you can let it go and it's not even a willful overcoming like it's not a direct attack necessarily because it's more like by connecting to this passional chaos and, and you see what this hegemonic morality doesn't quite that um, kind of effaces that that in itself un, in part undoes the sway of that hegemonic morality, and then you you come to see you're more able to let go of that hegemonic reality uh, morality. Sorry, um, and and part of the problem he says is a lot of us have the sense that Christian morality is no longer giving us meaning, but we can't let go of it. We have we're not allowing it to be undone, and so this re receptivity is sort of allowing it to be undone. 
because it's already weakened, but we're still letting it stay in its place. Right. So does the receptivity give way? I mean, this is my riff on it um, because I'm thinking about uh, just what the relationship is between the more um, uh, uh, f- between the, the, the sort of the apolitical Zarathustra and the much more political Nietzschean voice that we hear in, in other works, to what extent does receptivity give way to some kind of project of force depending on the, depending on the audience? So that uh, is, is force then reserved for those who aren't capable of, of overcoming the hegemonic systems, who, who don't have within them what Zarathustra seeks to be receptive to and, and the kind of uh, influence by his own receptivity to his own uh, um, passional chaos, as you say. Well, I think in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, there's very little mention of force and violence. And it right. seems to be that, um, you know, he really thinks in generational terms and that by these sort of individual acts of self overcoming in which individuals try to overcome the sway of hegemonic moralities in their individual lives, like over generations will gradually, in a sense, breed people who have let go of Christian morality. So it's this slow process um, that has little to do with external force, but a lot to do with this re- receptivity of individuals that's allowing them to let go of that hegemonic morality. Um, but it's also, I, I want to emphasize some, one thing, because I've, I've talked a lot about this passional chaos that you need to connect with. A large part of this Zarathustra, the book, is also about a need to accept the weight of the past. <laughs> Right. And the weight of history that threatens to repeat and derail any genuine struggle for change. And a lot of what Zarathustra teaches is that in some way you have to fully accept the intractability of the past, the fact that you can't change it. And only when you fully accept the unchangeability of the past are you able to treat the past as raw materials to be shaped into a new future. But if you don't accept the past and accept it in all of its horrible details, anything you try to create new will actually just be a rage or a revenge against the past and it'll be reactive. So I think I would wanna include in this receptivity a kind of acceptance to openness to the past and it's really hard to accept the past like i think that's one of the lessons of zarathustra that we're always wanting to undo it and that that he says is a recipe for never creating new values for having your values be entirely reactive yeah that seems to be this the principal test that he fails right i mean that that seems to be the 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 place where zarathustra can't quite overcome the temptation to take revenge on the past. Yeah, and and I think, and, and so that's where this doctrine of eternal return comes in. Like, you know, he's trying to create new values that embrace this world, but he says the test of whether you've embraced this human temporal world is that you can will its return in every single detail. You can will that it eternally recur. And if you can't will that it eternally recur, you haven't actually embraced this world and you're still manifesting rage against the past. But that is an incredibly high standard. It's saying you can only be creative and create new values and not just be reactive if you're able to will the eternal return of the world in all of its details. That is so hard to do because you're not just willing the eternal return of your own suffering, you're, you're willing the eternal return of other people's suffering as well. And I think this practice of passing by is a little bit of an alternative to the willing of eternal return. It's a different way of sort of just accepting the world as it is and letting it be 
and not raging against it. You kind of withdraw in order to try to take distance from it and sort of come to a, a, an acceptance of it, which isn't as dramatic as being able to will the eternal return, but you're kind of letting it be and suspending your rage against it. Yeah, it's it's a reconciliation rather than an embrace. And maybe yeah. it's, you know, maybe it's a necessary half step, maybe it's sufficient, but it's a very high standard. And it's interesting how much higher, how much harder I think it has to be for us in the whole post-Christian world and modernity as a part of the post-Christian world, right? I mean, if you're if you're an ancient, this, you know, the same crap cycles. Uh, uh, after Christianity, okay, history has uh, um, a direction and it has, uh, you know, an eschaton, uh, uh, you know, the big uh, apocalypse, finally things are, are better. And then modernity has a version of that. We're finally going to conquer nature and make the universe into a nice home for us. So it, it, to have that as your expectation and your standard and to view that as baked into reality somehow to, to divest yourself of that and to face the kind of suffering that the past uh, uh, presents to you is, is, I guess that's the danger of pity, yes. really. That's the thing that- <laughs> The other um, affect he doesn't like, <laughs> revenge. Yeah. 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 Um, let's see. Uh, uh, I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. Um, uh, for now, I'll ask, uh, so Chris Utter, Okay, I did not. I did not ask Chris to ask this question. In Beyond Good and Evil twenty six, <laughs> Nietzsche suggests <laughs> uh, that every choice human being wants to withdraw from the many, but yeah. that at some point this choice human being will need to go down. Yeah, you quote this. Uh, I can't remember if this or in the in the first chapter. Um, uh, every choice human being will will need to go down, and above all, he would need to go. I think this is twenty nine. Uh, no. Uh, Anyway, you will need to go down and above all, he would go inside. Uh, this sounds almost like Nietzsche is saying the philosopher needs to go down to the marketplace and go inside the cave, as, Socr as Socrates might put it, and go down, go inside. Um, how does this need to go down to the many fit with the need to withdraw, especially to withdraw from dialogue? Does the choice human being need to be among the many in order to realize how different he is from them. Yeah, I was thinking this when you had, you know, this really nice critique of the marketplace, because it sounds like the agora where Socrates spends all of his time. And so it seems like there's an implicit critique, maybe, of Socrates. But but so yeah, how do you how do you go down and go inside? And this this returns, I think, to what you're saying before about how you need to go down because you need to learn, you need to diagnose. But anyways, I don't want to put words in your mouth. But No, that's exactly right. I think like Nietzsche is very clear that, you know, he thinks of philosophers as really being the creators of new values. And he thinks that they can't completely withdraw <laughs> and exit the cave um, because they need to, to understand what they're trying to recreate. And um, so I think that um, that passage I actually take as an account of why it's necessary to pass by like you need to come close but then you need to veer away right passing by is not a complete avoidance right it's a coming close and then a veering away so it's this sort of in-between practice that allows you to know this world even as you're trying to create something new and so you, that you've got to be careful of where your body is in space so that you can you know, protect this passional chaos within and reconnect with it. I think that's a great passage that actually supports the act of passing by. Yeah. Yeah. So a, a couple of, of questions from students. Um, let's see. In addition to this chaos, flux and multiplicity, Nietzsche also talks about rigor as a means of honing in strength of will. How are these two ideas put together in Nietzsche, particularly without turning back to the will turned inwards. Oh, I said, yeah, how, how can the conscience of, of method not turn into the bad conscience might be one of those. What might affirming both of these things, strength of will and, and rigor uh, look like? Right, so um, I would have to look at this 
to just be sure, I'd have to look at the exact passages where the rigor and um, strength of will are discussed. But in part, um, uh, <laughs> so, and, and I'm I'm sorry if I'm not getting the exact sense of the question, but. Um, well, I think I think this is the question: is Nietzsche praises the internalization of the will because it gives rise to depth. Uh, yeah. it, it, it makes human beings more interesting. It gives rise to philosophy. Um, I mean, the, the, the sequence isn't exactly clear. In genealogy, it sounds like Christianity leads to philosophy. And, and beyond good and evil, it's, it's Plato that gives rise to Christianity. But in any case, um, the internalized will is bad when it condemns the will, it's good when it issues in a certain kind of strength in the form of interpretation, world interpretation and, and, and value creation. Um, I think, I don't know, that's, I just realized I, I gave my answer to the question. So, no, that's okay. <laughs> I wanna, uh, so I think that um, the way I see it in part is the first step in value creation is being receptive to this passional chaos. But for Nietzsche, it's never a case of, um, you know, you know, he is definitely about form, <laughs> right? So to create new values, you need to, in some way, reorder and rank order the passions within. Um, and the key difference he sees between his approach and Christianity is that Christianity's asceticism is about basically eradicating the passions. Whereas his version of asceticism, which is closer to the Greek word ascasis as exercise, is about training, <laughs> right? And the discipline of shaping your passions to give your life a new form. And so that's where I think of this like discipline and the exercise of the will is forming those passions into new values, giving your life form. That comes through ascasis, repetition, constant exercise. Um, and it's, it's extremely important to him. So Nietzsche is not about eradicating the passions. In a sense, he's about mastering them and giving them form through repetition. And I think that part of what I'm trying to get at in passing by is that you retreat to these spaces outside the mainstream on a, you know, in a repeated fashion, and there you engage in practices of ascasis, in exercises of shaping the self and trying to order the passions differently. So that's where the discipline that he repeats over and again a lot in Beyond Good and Evil, right? It's not, you don't create new human capacities by just letting things go, right? Um, it, it's all about discipline and formation and habit. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. But it's not exactly a discipline that the conscious mind simply imposes because it has to, it, it's a kind of expression of an internal fate that that is mediated by reason and can be shaped and channeled by reason. But it's not, it's not, you know, you don't just sort of decide to levitate into, into supermandom. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think it's one of the hardest things in Nietzsche. I think that, that in many ways we're fated to have certain tasks, right? Like that this is sort of, he says human beings have sort of tasks growing within them that are sort of a matter of their instincts and drives. But I think part of the space for our deliberate intentional work is in supporting that task in the right. brief habits that support that task and allow us to fulfill it. That's the space for agencies, like how we protect that task, how we let it grow, how, how we nurture it. And that's the space for the habits that support it. Yeah. I think that's a huge theme in, in Beyond Good and Evil, actually. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. He has a great line about poetry in that regard and uh, artistry in general as a kind of habit that's well yeah um let's see so here's a, a a question from my uh buddy and colleague tom merrill why is the idea of passing by important for you or for the rest of us mm -hmm. 
that is, that is, hey, um, that is, what would passing by mean for us today, apart from the question of how to understand Nietzsche's writings? <laughs> Why passing by for us? Yeah. So I think we, you know, anyone who thinks about politics often does think about what the rec prerequisites are for creating genuine change. And I guess I think that passing by in Zarathustra's uh, story um, is really uh, kind of a, 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 an approach to change that um, we never, we don't talk about so much in politics right now. Like I think we could talk about it a lot more. I'm not saying it's the only route to genuine change, but I think it's a route we have to discuss. And I do feel like um, a lot of the direct engagement and confrontation in contemporary politics is actually just fruitless and takes away for our, from our stamina for more far-reaching goals. And I think that um, I wanted to bring to the conversation um, this idea that disengagement actually may have a really important role to play in creating genuine new values, if that's if the creation of new values really is a path to change. Um, and I wanted to just, you know, really follow through on that possibility, um, in part just to shake up the assumption that all political participation is in and of itself good and i just don't think it is <laughs> and um mm. and and so even just looking at this more extreme tactic of passing by i think is worth it if only to shake that dogma up a bit but you know then even there i'm taking it back to just regular politics and that's not what zaratustra is interested in <laughs> right well i mean i think of like passion markel's book bound by recognition how uh the you know um, uh, obviously well-meaning political movements to expand recognition for marginalized identities has this kind of Hegelian catch where if you really push for recognition in a way you have bound your own self-understanding and yeah. your sense of your own dignity to getting other people to, to recognize you. And suddenly now you're over a barrel because now your sense of self is, is, much more dependent on other people who may not have a goodwill or may simply be in, incomprehending, um, uh, uncomprehending. So you can end up with a kind of a depleted self rather than a, a, an affirmed or empowered self. Yeah, I, 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 that's a great example because I think um, in terms of political theory discussions, I mean, right now we have um, this under this sort of idea in political theory of refusal, where you refuse the terms of recognition offered to you by the state. You see this in theorists of indigenous politics and in certain theorists of of, of racial oppression. That it, you know that actually we just need to refuse the terms of recognition of the state and regular politics altogether. And in a sense, when I'm looking at passing by, what I'm trying to understand is you know well, what does what does it take to really refuse what is it real what what is involved in really just um rejecting recognition by the state as a goal right what does it mean to really leave the ordinary categories of politics behind and like i guess what i'm part of what i'm trying to get at is like in order to properly refuse what 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 are the kind of existential conditions for that I mean, one of the things is I think you can't really refuse if you haven't fully accepted the past, right? Because if, if, you, if you haven't really accepted the past um, in its entirety, um, then your refusal in a way is always going to be half a rage against the past and you can't really refuse it. You can only refuse what you've actually really accepted. Um, 
so yeah um it's good that you brought that up because i really do think that this is part of a rejection of recognition yeah i mean a rejection can can proceed from different can can be in different spirits and so you can have a rejection that's still subject to uh reactive determination in which case you're you're it's sort of the worst of both worlds because you're not acting but you're still determined and locked into this position of reactivity uh that keeps you from being able to to move forward and i just want to underline because i you know you could be misunderstood here and i don't want you to be misunderstood it's not that accepting the past means reaffirming it or or uh uh yeah. you know accepting it in the sense that let's just find you know let's let's keep it going it's rather it's acceptance as a way of clearing the deck for something new yeah and also sort of accepting that that is the starting point for the future and right. we could wish it was a different starting point but it's not and so how do we work with the past as the raw material of the future? It's not to valorize the past. Right. <laughs> it's just to accept it as is the kind of the starting point of our creation. And that's really hard to do. Right. So uh, one more question, but uh, this is uh, my colleague, Adam Tomaszanski. I teach a class here at AU called The West's Problem of Evil. Our central book, Evil and Modern Thought by philosopher Susan Neiman, argues that Nietzsche's central concern with willing the world in its entirety cannot overcome the horror represented by the shorthand of Auschwitz, which stand in for Holocaust. I'd love to hear Dr. Sutkunandan reflect on that idea. Yeah, how can you accept something so monstrous? Wouldn't, wouldn't, the, wouldn't Auschwitz be in a way the limit case or a, a kind of something so anomalously evil that it would uh, put a stop to, to that kind of embrace? Yeah, so, so I guess the answer in a, I mean, I, don't, I, I know of the book and I am assuming in part she may be referring to sort of the doctrine of eternal return, like could you will the eternal return of the world in its entirety and it would be extremely hard to will the eternal return of something like Auschwitz, like you, you don't even want to sort of engage in that as a test of whether you can say yes to this world, it seems sort of off, right. Um, but that's why I think that this practice of passing by is a kind of acceptance that is maybe a bit more within reach. <laughs> um, and captures the fact that you need to know the past in its fullness and know, have a sense that the past has this, it just, it repeats, it really does repeat. Like it may not repeat exactly, but what happened in the past constantly reverberates into the future. And that's what the acceptance of passing by is. You accept the fact that the past in some way will repeat and you have to figure out how to create in spite of that and how to have the stamina to, to try to create something new in spite of the fact that you know the, the fact that you know the past will repeat right and that i think is the real challenge in politics like how do you create in full knowledge that the past will repeat repeat and i think that's part of what zarathustra is getting at like how do you have the stamina to keep struggling for change knowing full well that things will repeat and that every change every genuine change is an alteration of a repetition and maybe that's the best change we can get and i think i think that's that's what's involved in passing by right right um i i see one more question here uh uh we're uh i'll i'll sneak this in because it's it's nice and easy uh lawrence like asks is the world of becoming heraclitian flux yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just want to say yes. <laughs> I think that nature in, in, in some ways embraces Heraclitus. Yeah. I mean, there's a question, right? Because for Heraclitus, everything is flux, but it's also flux governed by the Logos. So. Oh, I see. Yeah. But it's also, um, but there's also this, you know, you know, 
it was it's all Heraclite and Flux also acknowledges conflict and 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 struggle and war in becoming, which I think is what Nietzsche also embraces in in Heraclitus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, Shalini Sutkunananda, and that this was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I I'm sure our audience enjoyed it as well. Um, this is marvelous. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. Uh, stay tuned uh, in the coming months for announcements. We may do something over the summer. Uh, this was a marvelous ending to uh, an already great year. So, um, Shalini, thank you. Thank you, Borden, and thank you, everyone. Thanks for the fantastic questions. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>